and the kind of I don't want to say the joy of that but yeah the kind of you know the nobility of that the kind of not cheap and not in the kind of cheap way but in a not in a cheap kind of you know it is honorable to do this but it is it is necessary we've seen again we've seen the one of some of the things we've seen in the last couple of years that to sacrifice the self to make sacrifices for the, the the community and for others' health and for the health of people we're never going we are never going to meet and never will actually you know is incredibly important the fact that so many of us have done it mm. is really important and i'm trying to talk about that in a more positive way Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and I'm here today with author Anna Smith Spark. Anna, thanks for joining me today. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Oh. You know, I'm always I'm always shocked when anyone says yes. So, I'm, <laughs> <I'm thankful. laughs> you know, I always get surprised because I I have to work up the courage to ask someone, and then when I finally work up enough courage, then I ask them, and when they say yes, it's like, oh, wow, that's it's like a a pop champagne kind of moment so thank it's you it's like it's like being famous i'm being interviewed i'm telling you it's like... <laughs> <laughs> you know whenever i uh whenever i talk to someone whenever i have an interview like this i always look at their bio that their bio and trying to find out a little bit about them and you know trying to get some questions in my mind and as i was looking at your biography i noticed that we share the same birthday oh huh. yeah so i thought that hey. was pretty cool yeah oh. pretty neat. capricorns so it's pretty cool yeah, our, our animal is the goat. Our planet is Saturn, planet of old age, misery and decay. Our metal is lead, and our jewel is the garnet, which is a beautiful stone, but is cons worth considerably less than diamonds, rubies, and other people's birthstones. So, yeah, go ask Capricorns. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, no, it's, no, if you put it that way, it's like, okay. Well, maybe we shouldn't celebrate that, but. I've always felt it's kind of fitting. It's yeah. Yeah, it is it is fitting. Uh, yeah, it does kind of fit Capricorns, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I'm okay with it though. You know. And that's another we're we seem to be an easygoing bunch, I think, yeah. Capricorns. So yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, you're the author of the Empire of Dust series. And so those those people who aren't familiar with it, how would you describe the series to them? Oh my goodness. Um so I tend to actually go for all the different genres and say it's it's epic, high, grim, dark fantasy because it is epic fantasy. It's they're not the biggest books in the world, but they are quite large. They are big, the fate of the world sort of things, multiple narratives, different points of views, slight moves around in time, all that sort of stuff that epic does. They are high fantasy, in fact, in that they're full of magic and dragons, as you can probably see from behind me, and weird ar arcane things. And in fact, there is stuff about prophecies and destiny and chosen ones. But they are extremely grimdark. Um, yeah, they are not. They are very dark. They are. F I think of them as actually as intensely romantic. Hmm. But they are also often described as nihilistic, which I guess I begin to accept they are. I never thought of them as nihilistic. I thought of them as realistic. And uh, I mean, yeah, they're, <laughs> I just think of them as realism, <laughs> epic <laughs> fantasy with a kind of realistic. Yeah, but it's probably not just going to end happily, is it, guys? Because yeah. that's reality. But yeah, no, they are bleak in some ways, but bleakly romantic intensely romantic i guess but they are yeah definitely grim dark they're definitely not the sort of neat good against evil happy and happy ending kind of um neat resolution epic fantasy they definitely have if i was locating them I pro i'm usually put in the same they're sort of me i'm usually put in the same bracket as R. scott baker and uh steve erickson so Steve, Steve Erickson was actually shocked when I told him that kind of, they, but there's this kind of core that who the core grim dark texts are. I was like, oh, that's not me. But yeah, I think if only it is, everyone. <laughs> but yeah, I have one, I was once described as Jar Abercrombie meets Leonard Cohen in a particularly filthy public toilet, which actually, <laughs> that was actually up on a bookshelf in a book, in Branch Waterstones in London, central London. 
which is <laughs> that's hilarious. I just, yeah, <laughs> which I love so much. But yeah, they've got that kind of grim, dark kind of yeah, sort of gritty, and also that that sort of really dark humor mm-hmm. and total war stuff. But or um, yeah, sort of our Scott Baker, but with more jokes and more. I don't want to say more humanity because Baker has got a lot of humanity, but more kind of apparent humanity. Mm-hmm. So, it's, yeah. it's it's funny you mention R. Scott Baker because I just finished The Darkness That Comes Before and I was looking at some some reviews and some people disagreed with his take on or how women were handled in the in the, in the series in the book. And I, 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 I took it as it's just a really violent and brutal and unforgiving world. Yeah. But is it ever a concern for you when you write a story that is that has those darker tones to are there certain things that you do to keep it from not going too far or do you just let the story tell itself yeah i mean it's difficult because i mean i one line i would not cross is i ne- i've never had a gratuitous rape scene there is in fact there's an awful lot of sexual violence taking place in the background of my books. They are books set in a total war environment. I mean, you can see, the, the backdrop I've got behind me is it's a massive invasion. That's an invasion force crossing a river. What those guys are going to do when they get to the first civilian, the first encounter with civilian encampment, it's fairly obvious. It is referenced because one of the things I don't want to do in my writing is sanitise what war is. It's that actually that slightly frightening thing that we're seeing from some elements of the press at the moment. It's like, oh gosh, it's so exciting. Tanks rolling on Kiev. Like, whoa. And you're like, yeah, you do the, you know, the the reality of that is not exciting. (laughs) And it's that making that, pointing out exactly really clearly what it is, which I always assumed was sort of implicit in other books. I kind of always assumed when people read, say, when you're reading The Two Towers, and what what the Uruk High are going to do when they breach Helm's Deep, I'd assume was just Tolkien just doesn't bother telling you because what's the point in saying that? And it was obvious. And when people are like, oh, it's this revisionist grimdark thing that's actually talking about these terrifying evil hordes doing terrifying evil stuff. I'm like, well, yeah. Um, kind of, what do you think happened? Why do you think the women are so scared? Um, so, yeah, I don't want to kind of... It's explicit that war is the pity of war is is con- is referenced, but what I didn't want to do was write the kind of very gratuitous described rape scenes, mm-hmm. and that kind of sexual violence is something I don't I don't want to write about because it's just there's a poetry to writing about battle. There's a huge tradition of battle poetry going back to the foundations of Western literature, certainly. The Iliad, the Old Testament, they are these, you know, these canonical founding texts for European literature are rooted in the finding poetic ways to talk about violence and to talk about battle. But find there is no poetic way to talk about rape and the butchery of civilians. And I'm not particularly interested in making that sort of that kind of very gratuitous sort of descriptions of sexual violence. But yeah, I want. So yeah, there's. That's just something I've not been interested in writing about. It's. It's not an interesting thing to read when you do re- read it. In some fans, they have read it. Obviously, you no know, people do use it. I don't find it particularly interesting. I mean, yeah, I try and. Baker, has very Baker famously has he has two women, in the first the first certainly the first three of his books have there are two female characters one is a prostitute one is a sex slave and there are some fairly explicit scenes involving rape or certainly all kind of non-consensual sex or sex that is purely for money i probably wouldn't have written those scenes but then he's writing that to show you the bleakness of his culture of his world his as far as my take on baker is very much he's this is he's writing a kind of total toxically masculine world in which women have no place other than as sex slaves or prostitutes and in fact in which men have no concept of sex as other than sex with sort of as other than rape and possession and what do you want what do you want in a woman you want an object you want a 
to feel that you own this woman mm -hmm. and the more beautiful she is and the more highly trained she is the better you feel about yourself as a man but obviously what one of his no nothing his characters never experienced actual that kind of love and desire mm -hmm. it's only a Camian in the end who looks at a woman as anything other than object and actually he's the only one who finds fulfillment in a relationship with a woman in terms of Feet emotion, friendship, love, caring. She cares for him, he cares for her, cares for her. And in fact, he's probably the only one who has any kind of decent sex as well. I mean, there's that wonderful scene. There is a terrifying scene of non-consent, that kind of horrifying non-consensual sex scene between, I can never remember his name, uh, the, uh, we have this sort of great and mighty prince. He's the war, he's a war leader, he's a great warrior, he's the heir to a great kingdom. I can't for life remember his name. And this slave, sort of slave girl is brought in and she's, you know, out of, she's the most beautiful woman out of all his many beautiful slave women. And she's been specially trained to be amazingly good. And he and she gets into some incredibly complicated position in her incredibly elaborate underwear and her she's stunningly amazing body. And she's obviously, you know, at best, she's lying back desperately going through a washing list or something, trying to take her mind off things. At worst, at work best, it is she has no interest. At worst, she is clearly being raped. But he cannot get any sexual satisfaction, in fact, because he has not, we well, you know, he might as well be, you know, she is nothing. She might as well be a lump of wood. He yeah. has no emotional feelings for her. He has no connection with her. He, can't, he doesn't speak to her. She doesn't make him laugh. All of those, there's no humanity. So when he's writing those scenes, he's writing them to show you there is no humanity. Other people don't. Mm -hmm. There are some really frighteningly gratuitous sexual violence scenes in some books, which I find totally uninteresting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess it's the line is, why are you writing this for me? It's that kind of, what is the point of this? There are bits where I will write. As while ago, I was writing something and I found myself writing about People go, people go into a village and I find myself writing about what they're doing to the civilians in the village. I just thought, well, why am I doing this? Hmm. I have written this. You know, we, I've established in this piece I'm working on at the moment that these are the very, very bad people. In fact, the book I'm working on at the moment has a much clearer concept of good and evil and that the, the evil characters are more... They are given less humanity. They are evil in the way that, say, the Ringwraiths are evil or the Rakai are evil. They are not. I'm not trying to explore their certain sense of themselves. I'm not trying to give them any kind of subjectivity. I'm not trying to explore them in any way sympathetically. They are some kind of external evil force. Mm. And I just thought, why am I bothering again? Why am I, why, I, I, you know, I've established that this is really bad things. So I don't need to do there anymore. I, I'm just going to draw a veil because it's just, it's just a bit, it's just repetitive. <laughs> it's just not, it's just, it is just being horrible for me. It's just being gross for gross's sake. Yeah. Although actually, I'm right, also writing thing with Michael R. Fletcher, which um, we were just allowed to go with the kind of dark humour side of it. And <laughs> <laughs> that Michael, we were like, okay, Michael well, then there's no, you know, there's no kind of. It's everyone you need is violent, so it's not. It is not kind of. There's not. It's not sexual violence. It's not kind of violence being inflicted by characters with agency on characters without agency everyone in all the people who write about have agency but within that we're like okay so we're just gonna how far can they go <laughs> to be absolutely <laughs> bloody disgusting to each other <laughs> within the context of the reader will kind of see kind of that they fundamentally deserve it it's that kind of pulp horror just how far can we go so again yeah, it kind of depends what i'm writing but yeah i'm actually trying to be more I'm trying to be more hopeful and I'm trying to be less graphic now because I think I've done that. And actually, God knows, maybe the last thing we need right now. <laughs> so maybe the, I think the world has probably moved on a little bit. I'm not sure I'll be writing now. I'm, I'm thinking I try and what I'm trying to write now, I was kind of moving on from what I wrote before, trying to find something slightly more, slightly lighter. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because I, I've been reading uh, a collection of obsessions <laughs> and I, you wrote the forward in it so yes yeah and it, you, i think it's mentioned in there that you you were collaborating with michael r fletcher and so i wanted to you beat me to the punch on that one i wanted to ask you about that so oh yeah that has been going on for forever um it shouldn't have been going on forever it's entirely me and 
Fletcher's fault. Um, although the little things like the pandemic and uh, both of us having to homeschool children, things kind of got in the way. But yeah, um, yeah, no, that was so Adrian Collins, Grim Dark Magazine really wanted the two of us to work on something. And we've, we've, de- Fletcher, Mike Fletcher and I are really good friends. Uh, I, I admire him hugely. I remember reading Beyond Redemption and just adoring it. And then, um, just the way I talk about it a lot in the introduction to the collection of obsessions, the way he is so human, he's got these horrible characters, but at the same time, they are just so real and human. And he's so, he really cares about them. He really loves them in the end. And actually you do care about them. You can see real humanity in them. And then actually the book of his, I love the most is probably uh, the all consuming, which is just, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, it's not called the all consuming. It was supposed to be called the all consuming um, swarm of steel, which is just, oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, it was supposed to be called The All-Consuming, apparently, but it's not, it's called Swarm of Steel. But that, um, the ending of that book is just, you bastard, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> <It's> like, just... <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, so we've been talking about collaborating for ages, and then Adrian Collins wanted us to collaborate. So the idea was, we had this idea like, hey, let's be really arty. So one of us will write the first chapter, short, this sort of first short chapter, and then we'll do it a bit like consequences. So rather than actually knowing, rather than sitting down, okay, this is the world, these are the characters, this is the plot. One of us will write something from, and then one of it, the next one will take it and just go with it. And then, so he'd write chapter one, I'd write chapter two, then he'd write chapter three, then I'd write chapter four, but with no structure, we'd just be like, okay, this is where Fletcher's taken it. So, oh, I'm going to take it over here now. And then he's like, oh my God, she's taken it over there. Like now I need to go back over here, <laughs> which of course, kind of <laughs> led to complete chaos <laughs> i think we did actually had an editorial meeting at some point where um mike myers was like guys did you guys do you guys actually go back and read over this you have any sense of what's happened <laughs> well, no we can kind of remember what happened I, I i wrote i read chapter one at the time and then i wrote chapter two and now we're on chapter six i can vaguely remember what happened in chapter one and two um he was like guys <laughs> so um, but it's art it's art and there's Adrian like yeah but, <laughs> but yeah it got terribly arty but it got terribly like gosh this is such an experimental free-ranging um piece of lunacy and it got rained in a bit but it's done it is completely done and it is being edited at the moment it has got through the pandemic it's got through both of us having to do homeschool children and got through all it's got through and it's done and it's it's got through our completely totally chaotic and we did actually have a, we eventually even had a planning meeting hmm. to come up with some vague ending which i then tore up and threw apart and rewrote <laughs> so, but it is done and it is being edited and it is going to be published at some point by grim dark magazine oh that's awesome things have got a bit better but yeah and that was a lot of fun because that was just it wasn't i was not in my kind of i'm going to be profound and philosophical here it was definitely in the kind of I'm just going to have so much fun with the dark humor side of me <laughs> being fetch. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to reading that. That's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And Michael R. Fletcher is such a great guy. He's yeah. a really fantastic person. Yeah. So. And I did, um, from the time that I, you know, I did check into some other interviews you've done and which you're buying and you're, you have a, an obsession with um, ancient history. And I wondered if there was any periods of time that, particularly influenced you uh, in writing your stories? Yeah, so kind of Marith and his army and a lot of the battle scenes are all based on classical mythology so that, and sort of classical war stuff. So Marith comes, the Empire of Dust comes a lot from when I was studying ancient, I studied classics at university, my BA was in classics. So I, the, a lot of the fight scenes come from the Iliads, the character of Marith is heavily influenced by Alexander the Great. I had my specialist subject was Alexander the Great, which was just awesome. Um, when I was at university, it was brilliant studying the analysis of Alexander and the big battle scenes. So actually the big set piece battle scenes in the Empires of Dust are taken, f- are, I actually use the battle schematics for Alexander's big battles and basically wrote them out. So the troop movements are Alexander's troops. So actually the, the backdrop behind me, the picture behind me, which is, it was a wonderful sky. My friend Saz, Saz Barodin drew that for me and sent it to me. That's called Crossing the River. And that's true. That's an army of troops crossing a river to invade a country. And that's based on the Battle of Hydaspes, 
which is when Alexander invaded. He's supposed to have invaded India. What he actually invaded was he crossed. He just about got into what's now Pakistan. So he, people talk about him as conquering India as if he kind of, you know, conquered the whole of the Indian subcontinent and actually kind of just about crossed from Afghanistan into what's now Pakistan. So, um, yeah, but yeah, he, he, he's such a, we, we, we pretend he conquered the whole of India because that sounds way cooler. But that's, that's based on that battle. And so all the battles in Empires of Dust, the big battles are based on his battles. And I had a lot of fun taking those battle schematics and turning them into real battles, it's actually describing how they feel and trying to talk about like the cavalry charges are actually Alexander's cavalry charges and sort of imagining how that might have been and how those battle schematics might have traced. Uh, translation to reality. So obviously the weapons, the Saris are the Sarissas, even Marith's title, Alex Ask Ak whatever his title, his title, Akisaresis and McCain, that comes from Iskander, which was the Persian word for Alexander. So um yeah, but so yeah, so Marith's armies are classic well they're uh sort of Hellenistic, I guess, Alexandria's they're Macedonian armies. The city of Solost is kind of based on Central Asian cities. It's sort of based on some of the big cities, which we now think of as in the desert, like Samarkand, Balkash, the kind of big cities of Central Asia, which we see now as having been in the desert. But actually, at the time, those des those areas were much more heavily irrigated. Hmm. So there was we always have this we have these incredible romantic notions in Europe of living in somewhere which is this sort of green and pleasant land, we always have this idea of how on earth did they have these massive cities in the desert and how did they not have any rivers? Well, actually, they had loads of irrigation and green fields. It's just, it seems to us, this canal, this kind of bizarre concept of these ruined cities in the desert, so it must have always been desert. But, yeah, so those are the kind of great cities of Central Asia and the, the desert around Solost is basically the Taklamakan Desert, hmm. which is now famously, there's all these sort of stories about its name means you come in and you don't come out again, which it doesn't, but... <laughs> but that's what I, that kind of gives you an impression of what the desert's like. Yeah. So very well. yeah, it's kind of so it's those those are the two big, big periods of history that I'm really really interested in the classical period because I studied it at university for three years, and it's possible to read so much about it and know so much about that period, and then the sort of Central Asian history, the whole. Sort of prehistory and history of Central Asia is something up until the kind of early modern period is something I'm really keen on. And then the White Towers are based on Dark Age Britain or Bronze Age Britain, which is obviously something as someone who lives in England is something I've and is interested in history. It's obviously the sort of history I'm most familiar with hmm. and I'm interested in. Yeah. And you mentioned the artwork behind you, and those are those people who can see it and who, who have checked your website, go check out the website, is uh, there's a ton of what really great, really beautiful artwork. And we were talking a little bit before we started the recording about how that's, that was all from uh, fans of the, of the series. Is yeah. that yes. Yes. It's, um, it's quite unbelievable. And um, my, actually my editor told me she thinks I get more fan out than almost anyone else. Hmm. I got there. Yeah, there are a couple of, I mean, there's some amazing guys, um, Quint Von Cannon, who draws the most incredible black and white, to pencil drawings, which is the, actually a style of art I've always absolutely loved. It's one of the most amazing black and white pictures of um, pencil drawings for me. Uh, he's drawn some actually incredible pictures of Marith. Um, yes, uh, Stas Barodin, who did the paint picture behind me. Who again, just does these absolutely amazing scenes of battle, and he's got some actually incredible scenes of Marith. Just, yeah, uh, loads of people, most amazing fan art by people. Jekka Durakovic, who does these amazing, sort of slightly cartoony, quite cartoony, sort of mangary pictures for me. It's just quite incredible. And then I had a composer who composed the music for me. He just contacted, he contacted my agent saying he's a film composer and he int was interested in doing some little bits of composition for people's book, based on people's books, in the same way that people who can draw <laughs> might do fan art. And in exchange for some, I sent him signed copies of all three of my books. And in exchange, he did me a 10 minute soundtrack for wow. the novels, which is, I mean, it's just mind blowing. It is, honestly, it is like he is, he's a film composer and it really shows you could, it's, so it's, yeah, I made a video using the art and the music and it put it to put it together. And 
to be honest, the video slightly freaks. The video just puts shivers up my spine because it really is. The music is quite unbelievable. It's quite. It's got a bit of the Game of Thrones soundtrack, a bit of the Game of Thrones credits music going in. It's got some. There's definitely a bit of the Lord of the Rings going on. It's sort of he's picked up on the sort of Central Asian interest. So he's got this very haunting female, slightly sort of Arabic influenced vocals. It's just. It's just, it's just absolutely astonishing. I've also had cake recipes. I've had oh. fan cakes and cocktails as well, oh, which are so cool. <laughs> I had two cocktails, and then someone actually made, um, it's a very, very brief reference to something called curd cakes, which are just mm. like little cre cream cheesy kind of tart things, which people, which they eat at one point in the Good Broken Knives. And someone made them for me. And all the ingredients in the cake, she went through the book and she found things, all the f different foodstuffs as a reference. So she made them with honey and cream cheese. And there is sugar in there. But she's saying if you're a bit flexible about the idea that they must have some kind of sweetener, and you think of honey as a sweetener, every single ingredient is, can actually be found in the book. So these the people in the book, people in my world could actually make these cakes because they have all the foods that have all the foods that's needed to make the cakes. And yeah, and that was just unbelievable. So actually, I then wrote a short story for a magazine in which there's a reference to people eating these cakes and that there's a big scene in which someone makes the cakes. So I've now written those cakes into my into another one of my books as well. But yeah, it's a, it's just, you could sit listening to my music, what, looking at my pictures, eating my cakes, <laughs> not eating my book. As someone who, so I can't draw at all. I can write, but I can't draw, I can't, composing I can't play any instruments I can't sing I have no sense of time to I really I couldn't I don't think I'd be capable of learning an instrument I, I have no ability to sing at all I can't <laughs> draw stick figures and the fact that people can do this and then so Stas is always like yeah but Annie you wrote it and I'm like yeah but I can't draw it the fact that you know you can do that <laughs> kind of it's just it is quite mind-blowing to me that I wrote these things and then people create these amazing pieces of well I mean, you know art yeah. it's not illustrations you know it's it's that some of the stuff i've had drawn for me is seriously it's art it's just incredible and it just astonishes me that people can do that <laughs> and i did that it's um yeah it's this incredible incredible feeling yeah it must be really amazing to to inspire yeah. someone to to use their talents like that and create something for yeah. That, that must be really heartwarming and just it yeah you know, it's, it's just breathtaking it's just humbling as well it's amazing yeah so many so many wonder for as as you know for as much bad news as we hear everywhere and it's not hard to find a lot of bad news but there's so many wonderful people out there that uh just do really great things yeah uh, all the time. so it's it's a good reminder that there are there are really great people out there yeah, and actually what's lovely is a lot of the people who do the fan art for me do lots of fan art for other people's books they love. So Quint's done some amazing drawing for my Clough Fletcher as well. And it's that kind of, and we all got to know each other now. So it's like that kind of sense of, yeah, just a real community of people that I look on as just, you know, it's really good friends. I've never met them, but I really look upon them as really good people I care about and who I'm friends with. And yeah, and it's just... And yeah, it is wonderful. It really is wonderful. That's really great. And I almost hate to ask you this because I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand times, but it, it's it's always interesting to me what everyone's different uh, what everyone's different definition is of grimdark. <laughs> everyone has a different definition. Yeah. No one can agree on it. Uh, what is your when asked this, if someone were to, someone were to ask you what is grimdark? How would you describe it to them? See, I actually see it as not so much the kind of the violence, although obviously the the violence is a big part of it. As I said, I think, I mean, a lot of something like the Wheel of Time tends to kind of rather draw a veil over exactly what's going on and the fact that what the goodies are doing is also you know, horrible. And there's that kind of glorification of all that. It's kind of those wonderful children's television programmes you watch where there are these huge battles where you realise that no one's got killed. Yeah. And kind of it's that kind of that sort of level of yeah, you're obviously you're kind of striding around killing a whole lot of people but you don't really see that and yeah so the violence is obviously a big part of it but for me the point is the cynicism or the kind of realism the real politic the kind of awareness that it's much more complicated than good versus evil 
that kind of even if you do have a character who is good what the things that they're doing are going to have consequences which may be catastrophically bad mm. is that kind of real world and yes it does become cynical and it does become that sort of <sighs> taking apart the great the kind of concept of the leader really trying to sort of taking apart a bit what's going on i actually always think of terry pratchett some terry pratchett's books as profoundly grimdark in some ways because it's that constant kind of you know your heroes of of feet of clay that that one there's a wonderful line rincewind has one somewhere which is um you, you know who wants to die for their principles you can only you've only got one life but you can pick up another set of principles <laughs> we just turn down turn down the next street it's that kind of incredible cynicism but also incredible kind of realism that kind of what are you doing yeah. <laughs> kind of attack on fanaticism of either side that kind of so I actually always say I just that Grimdark kind of you look at when people at like Abercrombie and Mark Lawrence first start writing actually though it, it comes out of a kind of time when it feels a bit safer to be writing that very kind of deliberately writing the anti-hero someone like George where you're deliberately writing a character who is absolutely appalling beyond any kind of if you're in any kind of pale he is so far beyond any kind of line anyone could draw and he's cool and you do can't you do root for him you do think he's really cool I have a massive crush on him but it's coming out of time when it's kind of maybe a bit safer to write that than it is now and again Game of Thrones with its constant kind of dialogue about well, there's you know you're sort of holding up Ned Stark as this kind of man of honor and principle, and then you're pointing out for all the huge flaws in being a man of honor and principle, and the fact actually he's terrifying, and what it is that in fact his honor and principle leads to, and you're kind of constantly undermining the narrative of the hero that in Game of Thrones, which is actually becomes a bit of a dead end because I don't know where it's going to go now, but you know that kind of. <laughs> It did feel like it was a slightly safer age to be writing that stuff. Mm. I mean, kind of, again, the sort of Baker is the kind of the absolute end point of this, where you start reading the book and you th you start reading The Darkness Becomes Before. And you, I, you have this character who's obviously presented as this kind of amazing chosen one destined hero. And you start thinking, oh, I'm a bit suspicious of him. Mm. And you're like, oh, I'm really suspicious of him. <laughs> And then you're like, okay, I can see where this is going. Oh, God. And you do kind of feel he predicted a hell of a lot of stuff that's happened in the last couple of years in terms of people standing up and saying that they, they, we need to follow them. And if we just follow them, they'll lead us They'll lead us to the great times and it'll be wonderful. And it does kind of doesn't feel as safe to be there anymore. I think Grimdark is kind of... I think Grimdark will be kind of becoming less... I certainly wouldn't want to be publishing my books now for the first time hmm. because I don't think commercially, I don't think I would certainly want to be publishing them now for the first time. I can't even know if someone was launching, if series two of Game of Thrones was launching now, I think a lot of people would be like, oh my God, why do I want to watch? Do I really want to watch more late hmm. middle-aged white dudes with lots of money and power completely screwing over <laughs> loads of other people's lives? Actually, no, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I really don't want to watch that anymore. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. actually that kind of notion of maybe writing something a bit, a bit more hopeful and a bit more mm. kind of, not the kind of, we're going back to the chosen one, but a bit more kind of hopeful about communities and people kind of working together is something that certainly I'm interested in now. Kind of grimdark kind of, I did a lot of leveling of the ground. I do like, I think of my books, my, I think of The Empires of Dust as very much about kind of tearing down that terrifying notion of the great white knight who's going to ride on his white horse and save us all. And really kind of taking apart that in fantasy, which is such a problematic trope in fantasy. I mean, when I say white knight, I kind of like, sick, I mean white knight. <laughs> There's so many issues about, I wouldn't kind of want to say he and him. I mean that very much as the kind of, you know, this very sort of taking apart that, that, that sort of, which is still actually quite, you know, people kind of say, oh, people, you know, people have been doing that for ages. 
but it's still kind of take it's still such a big thing in a lot of mainstream fantasy and jo grimdark did kind of really take that apart when you've got characters like george george ancrath who is really kind of you know he's the hero but he's really not the hero <laughs> and but i kind of feel like it's time to to build now we kind of to yeah we kind of really we knew it from all but now we need to kind of <laughs> try and build it up rebuild a bit i guess maybe that's interesting. I didn't think of it that way. That's 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 a good point. That just people are tired of of bad news, I guess, and not some positive. Yeah, I mean, I kind of even look at this picture. It's like this picture behind me, which is super cool, but it is a bunch of people invading another people's someone else's country, which kind of like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Suddenly, seems a bit more, slightly more sort of. Ooh. Yeah, it's like oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> And of course, yeah. I know, actually, I mean, I know people actually have been saying in the last couple of days, but, you know, Yemen has been having absolutely just the crap kicked out of it for years now by Saudi Arabia and basically by Britain and the US providing, selling huge amounts of weaponry to Saudi Arabia and just, you know, completely tolerating it. But what's happened in the last couple of days kind of feels like, OK, we are back to a kind of massive empire rolling another or another country kind of it's not that it's not that the people of ukraine matter more than the people of yemen because obviously they don't and it is that again there's a slightly frightening people are suddenly talking about oh it's so terrible bad things happening in the world like a lot of bad things have been happening in the world for a long time just they haven't usually been talking to white european christian people and now they are and maybe that's you know i i can understand there's a lot of there's a lot of anger outside the west about the fact that suddenly people in britain people in america and europe are getting very very upset about like oh my god look, people are dying because people are dying all over the world in war at the moment and people are kind of it's not the people of ukraine are worth more but the fact that a massive nuclear superpower has decided it's just gonna you know it's gonna do something that hasn't happened since the second world war basically yeah. is it feels like a whole nother place to be in now we're writing about the clash of empires mm. and big empires rolling over smaller states just feels slightly kind of um yeah yeah <laughs> yeah a bit more a bit more sensitive yeah yeah is that a concern for you when you if you have an idea in your mind that you have a story that in your mind that's kind of brewing for you is this something that you might put on the shelf for later and just save for a better time is that ever something you consider or do you just kind of go with ideas as they come to you uh, so i guess i mean I, I suppose i'm just sort of i think my brain is just trying not so i'm trying to write stuff that is a bit more positive at the moment that is more about kind of communities and people redeeming themselves and about sort of people is much is i suppose more kind of there are good people and there are things which are evil and the things which are evil in the end doing harm to the things which are evil has to be justified mm. and I suppose I'm thinking more in those terms now mm. and I think the last couple of years I mean I'm not saying what's happened in Britain in the last couple of years is evil but it's been you know seeing kind of just the kind of the narrative's becoming so much more heated and so much more this sort of division. And I think my mind is just responding by trying to write, think and write in a slightly different way. Um, it's, I guess, there, I mean, there's some kind of timing, weird sort of timing issues. Like I kind of look, I look at the description of the plague I wrote in um, <laughs> The Tower of Living and Dying, where there's a massive section where there's a city with a plague and I wrote a lot about the plague and I look back at that thinking kind of like, well, God, um, I did kind of get some of it right, actually. <laughs> Slightly disturbing. I mean, the stuff, me and, the thing me and Fletcher wrote, actually, I'm looking at it thinking, oh, God, this has possibly got a slightly different twist on it now. <laughs> if it was being published tomorrow, I think I'd slightly be like, oh, because it is kind of a big war thing <laughs> and it's people being very flippant and cynical about war and kind of, that sort of yeah which um 
but no, I think my mind has just been working. I haven't actually written much in the last couple of years because of COVID, partly for practical reasons, because I was homeschooling. Too. I was, when I say homeschooling, I was looking after completely two children, mm. which is obviously mentally absolutely exhausting. And also I just found myself very mentally tired. It's quite difficult to write when I'm so cut off. I am um, having people around me three days a week. I usually work in an office. I'm a, I work in a, just in an office for a day, my day job. And that having, you know, having people around me, a lot of the dialogue between the soldiers in Empires of Dust is just ripped off from conversations that work colleagues and had and things that sort of slightly hard bit. And, you know, they, they've been there for 20 years. They've seen the same things come and go. They do kind of feel kind of, they feel kind of under the cosh all the time. And that human being around other people was a really important way of keeping my sort of, really important creative source in my mind and it just went all of that I found you just write a scene where something like you know he took a hand you're like oh, you can't tuck a hand oh my god <laughs> he touched took a hand and he ran off and washed his hands <laughs> disinfected his hands before coming back so you making sure he stood two meters away from me <laughs> uh, I just I didn't know how to write that kind of <laughs> so um so yeah I kind of haven't written that much and yeah <laughs> The last two years have been two years plus, I guess now have been just really fascinating in how all of us have changed or just even just yeah. day, day routine, just everything is different. It's really fascinating how that's affected all of us. It's interesting. Um, and I was curious, uh, when did you start writing? Oh, actually, this is my big motive. So big motivationary story. Um, so I wrote all the time when I was a child. I wrote, I could barely write. I was actually, I was the last person in my class to read and write. I'm mm -hmm. dyslexic. I remember really clearly staggering through those awful little, I don't know if you, if I say Janice and John, does that mean anything to you as an American? You know, those awful little, Jane has the ball. Peter has the ball. Yeah. Peter and Jane have the ball. Yeah, that's awesome. stuff. Yeah, I remember sort of staggering through those when everyone else in my class had moved on to actually reading kind of not no not big novels, but you know they're actually reading proper books, mm -hmm. and my spelling was absolutely appalling. I remember really, I found little notebooks I wrote, and it was completely illegible. But I was writing stuff. My dad is a poet, mm -hmm. and a poetry and a publisher of poet of sort of poetry, and an editor and critic. So I grew up with basically all the adults around me, but both my parents were also in education. My mum was a teacher. My dad was a high, uh, FE teacher. So basically everyone, all the adults around me were poets and playwrights and artists and musicians. And so it was entirely natural to me to write. So I always, I actually always wanted, I sort of, when I was a child, I assumed I'd grow up to be a writer. Then, and it was always fantasy and science, sort of fantasy and kind of science fiction stuff I was writing. I wrote, Matt wrote lots of fantasy stories, riffs on Celtic mythology. Most of the stories were actually, all the stories I realise now, the print, the char main characters were always Marath and Thalia in different guises. They always, they were always with me, those two. And then I had sort of massive mental health issues as a teenager, and I just stopped writing fiction completely. Um... I did, I mean, I, I got through university, in fact, I sort of say I stopped writing, people said I clearly didn't stop writing because I did a BA, a MA and a Master's, so I didn't stop writing, but I stopped writing fiction completely. Mm -hmm. And then once I'd done my Master's, I just, once I'd done my PhD, I got a job. And I actually used to, I always sort of felt I couldn't become a writer. It mm -hmm. became this massive thing from it having been something I'd always wanted to do and that I just did naturally all the time, telling myself stories, writing things down it became this thing that was like, I just said this to um, the wonderful English fantasy novelist, Jen Williams. It's a really lovely person. Um, I sort of said to her, it felt like if I sat down and started, you know, opened up a notebook or a computer and typed out, and it was a dark and stormy night, the sky would open and someone like Jen Williams would kind of appear. <laughs> oh, you think you can be an author? <laughs> and, sort of, um, and it 
and then because I because I'd always wanted to write and because I read a lot people kept giving me I remember being given the grant a book of young women not new women novelists and it was like mm. just you know just you want to pour some lemon juice on that kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> just oh yeah and actually I used to feel really sad I actually would avoid particularly the fantasy section mm. in bookshops because it really felt like kind of and I read at that point I basically was only reading big kind of 19th century classics because it kind of felt like okay you probably can't I probably can't ever you know the fact I'm not George Eliot is probably fine you know most people can, can accept that they are probably not George Eliot most people can kind probably accept that they are not Dostoevsky most yeah. people you know so that was safe but going into a bookshop and picking up a book by someone like Jen Williams and having you know she what what, what is it about her how has she been touched by God that she <laughs> has managed to write a book <laughs> and I clearly I'm just not capable and not worthy and then actually after I was weirdly I was in my early 30s and I'd just been diagnosed with um finally been diagnosed as having Asperger's syndrome and I just started writing and I started writing a scene of there was some soldiers in a desert I didn't know why they were in the desert I didn't know where they were they were in the desert I didn't know where the desert was and then a dragon turned up and they were fighting the dragon I had no idea why the dragon had turned up I had no idea what was going on at all but it just sort of happened and that is what is now chapter two of the god of broken knives oh, wow. and I just wrote and I had no idea what the plot I had no idea who these people were I had no idea what the plot was I had no idea where they were going so that discover that process of discovery they go through of where they're going and what's actually what's going on and then what's actually going on that was me discovering all of that as I went along as well and then when so and in a year I'd written the draft the sort of the cop the, the draft of the Court of Broken Knives that got me my agent <laughs> just without thinking without kind of and now I've just been writing apart until until the unpleasantness I have been writing fairly you know daily from that point it's and was just actually people in my day job were saying to me they had never seen me I was working in my day job at a new higher level than they'd ever seen me mm. because I just from actually from just no, I just was just transformed as a person from suddenly just having that book come out of me and suddenly this writing was just coming out of me, coming out of me, coming out of me. And every aspect of my life was just better and different. And then the unpleasantness happened and, yeah, <laughs> I'm sort of picking myself up from that. But, yeah. So what was that? What was that feeling like when you went from not believing you can do it to actually doing it and having an agent and you're being published? What What did that feel like for you to to see your, your book on the shelf in the book that the bookstores used to be in. What was that like? See, I still kind of can't believe it. My agent kept saying to me, you, he could, I couldn't believe it. Could I? No, I actually, I, there's a bit in, I can't remember for the life of me where I read this. Oh, it's in, it's in a Neil, there's a bit in a Neil Gaiman Sandman story where someone talks about, there's a, someone says that, of course, this is a theory that Miracle Man is dying and that all of this is the product of his brain having a seizure in the last moment of his existence. And I kind of, I keep thinking, I'm dying. This is, you know, this is my brain. All of this is my brain having a seizure in its last moment of existence because there's no way this is real. This is what has happened to me. It's just not, I'm going to wake up. I still kind of, I cannot believe it. I really still feel like I'm going to wake up sometime and it's just never, none of this is going to happen because it just feels... And actually just really stupid things like finally once I've signed all the paper, once I signed all the contracts to actually get given the advance from the books being published, my agents, the sort of secretarial people from the agent, my agency all emailed me sort of saying, you know, can, I have, can we have your bank details now? Because obviously we need to pay you the large amounts of money for these books, which are going to be turned into amazingly beautiful hardball books. And I'm like, oh, my God, I've just worked this out. This whole thing is a sting, isn't it? They're doing all of this so they can strip my overdraft out of my bank account <laughs> it was still a bit like it still feels a bit like that sometimes oh that's incredible that's an incredible story that's so wonderful just, 
yeah well it's just kind of yeah it is kind of yeah <laughs> That's uh, yeah, that's really great. That's I'm sure that that'll inspire that that'll inspire lots of people to to follow. You yeah, know, it's never they're... too late. You get these sort of stuff about these kind of hotshot teenage hotshot really young authors, and for one thing, I often think actually it's not until you've been around a little and seen the world a little that what you're writing is really interesting. The most interesting books are often written by people who are slightly older who kind of have that more complicated experience of. Mm life and life events but also it's not too late this is one of the really sad thing i heard once is someone at my work who saying that they when they retired they were going to go on a writing retreat and they were going to write a novel because you know at the moment they didn't feel they had time and they felt that to write a novel they obviously you know you need to go away and be in silence and you know have get away from everything and be in a right you know not have life intruding on you and it just felt really sad that people kind of feel that. I mean, obviously, life is really tough. Mm. And for any of us with caring responsibilities, we all we all have to work. In fact, more of us, we have to work. Lots of us have to work more and more and more now. It feels really hard saying to people, just make time, because you're like, for so many people now, you've got your job and you've got your side hustle. And you've probably got your side hustle on your side hustle. And you've got kids. <laughs> and we've got, you know, all the crap we've just been through. And you've got, you know, you've got, your mother-in-law with dementia or you've got you know your next door neighbor who's had got long covid and all of that stuff that we're just drowning in and it does feel really awful to say oh just make time but at the same time it's like just make time you don't need to write I actually often say to people you know if you look at the number of plays william shakespeare wrote plus all the poems william shakespeare wrote plus the fact he was starring in that you know he was he was in theater he was presumably doing those plays on stage plus he actually seems to have quite an interesting personal life he didn't sort of, you know, sit in splendid isolation for years and years, communing with the muse in silence. He clearly had a whole load of stuff going on, and yet he somehow managed to bang out <laughs> The Midsummer Night's Dream, Lear and Romeo and Juliet. And you do have to make time. And it, yeah, I'm coming that from a position of privilege where I have a decent salary and support around me, but you don't need to kind of block out a year of your life just to write you just fit it in see it as self-care and fit it in yeah. as much as you possibly can it, it can be really tough to... yeah no it can be really tough it's and actually people are recognizing that as well there was that people kept saying for years about kind of um the principle of raising warning flags that Publishing is again becoming a thing that only wealthy people can do. Advances are a lot smaller than they were. It is just there are just time pressures on people that mean that people were alarmed that commercial publishing would be. To write a, a novel is a thing that only people who actually have an income that will support them and the writing is a kind of hobby, which is obviously quite alarming because it means that a lot of people who can't afford to only work part-time to write a novel are going to really really suffering with that and then the last couple of years I think it's shown a lot of people that it's hard and it's really hard for a lot of people and made people a bit more aware of that again so I don't know whether they'll I don't know what changes there'll be but we have just become more aware in the last couple of years I think of just how much work some people are doing and picking up that isn't being rewarded for and that people need to kind of think about that and make allowances for that i don't know but if you can make time <laughs> it's all like it's all i can say really and i did also notice in your in your bio that you've been a teacher before and i, I was wondering what did you learn about yourself during your time as a teacher that i'm an absolutely terrible teacher <laughs> 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 That's why I left higher education. So I did my PhD and I was doing some teaching while I was teaching PhD. So I was doing my PhD and I just realised how absolutely bloody awful I was. <laughs> and that's why I didn't, that's why I had to leave academia. <laughs> Always make it, there are all these highfalutin reasons as well. Like, you know, it's, there is a lot of job, job insecurity and I actually quite wanted to kind of settle down and not have that. But next week a job might come up in America and I might just have to relocate because, you know, you can't be picky and choosy anymore. But actually... It was actually because I was such a bloody terrible teacher. It would never have worked out. 
Oh, it's, you, you don't know until you try, I guess, right? <laughs> and uh, and we did have some questions from Twitter. Yes. Uh, just really quickly. So, friend uh, Peter McLean wanted to know, uh, what's your thoughts on Mary Renault are and why it's been such an influence on you? Oh, see, Mary Renault, if people haven't heard of her, she writes quite romantic historical fiction set in ancient Greece. So her most famous books are, she wrote the Alexandra trilogy, the central novel of which, The Persian Boy, is often apparently often described as the greatest historical novel ever written. So it's the slight, it's life of Alexander told from the point of view of a real historical character, Persian eunuch, Bagoas, who was supposedly, you know, the most beautiful young man, most beautiful was a young adolescent boy in Persia, was at the court, was the, basically was the, the teenage, was the kind of 13, 14 year old sex slave of Darius, the last emperor of Persia somehow then ended up being handed on to Alexander the Great and seems to have become, was also then clearly Alexander the Great's lover, sex slave, however you want to describe it, and sort of followed Alexander through his campaigns. In fact, seemed to have gone with the army, unlike Roxanne, Alexander's wife, who went with the civilians throughout following the army. Bagoa seems to have followed the army, been with the army even through the Macran Desert and made out, made it out the other side. So a lot of, so, and Renault kind of writes about him not as, <sighs> she does kind of gloss over the fact that essentially, I mean, you're talking about a 13, 14 year old boy who's been castrated and sold to the Imperial Palace as a very beautiful boy for the emperor to have sex with and she right she hugely romanticizes it and he falls he falls in love with alexander alexander falls in love with him it is an astonishing book it is just mind-blowingly beautiful it's just impossibly beautiful this great epic love story between these two i mean it's kind of it is an amazing epic love story and it is genuinely very moving and just her descriptions, her the way she can imagine herself into ancient Greece is quite astonishing. She also, her, The Last of the Wine, which is also one of her great masterpieces, is about a young man who is one of the people in the coterie of young men around Socrates. And he's living through the last days of the Peloponnesian War and the fall of Athens and the death, the, the murder of Socrates. So within that kind of backdrop, she again, it's a love story between him and a slightly older young man who's all in in Athens. They're both aristocratic. They're both they fight in they, they fight in the last days of the Peloponnesian War. They fight for the liberation of Athens. It's so a lot of people suspect that Ren. I mean, Reno. There's a lot of kind of evidence that she was essentially this. She was escaping into this was the world she was. This is what she wanted to be. It's possible if she was 16, 17 now in modern England or in modern America, she would very possibly have been certainly gender neutral, gender fluid, very possibly have transitioned. You know, what she's writing is essentially her fantasy of herself as a young, physically very athletic man doing very kind of alpha male things. She writes about soldiers. She writes about people, right? She writes about soldiers in a kind of and Homer very, very much about homoeroticism in in kind of classical Athens. It works amazingly because classical Athens was an intensely homoerotic military society. She somehow gets it. She can somehow visualize you know, the creation, she way she creates ancient Greece. I mean, I have no idea, but you know, I've studied I studied classics, it seems convincing to me. It's utterly convincing. And also her world is utterly convincing in things like it's the way she writes about their relationship with the gods, for example. It is a fantasy, it's a essentially a fantasy world, and this is a numinous world. The gods are there. It's not a kind of clanking and then Zeus kind of turns up and he's just a man but big in the way that some 
fantasy novel and historical sort of some fantasy novels or kind of mythological novels like the song of achilles trying to do with that kind of bizarre and then this kind of 10 foot guy who's really really powerful turns up and he's a god but the world is saturated in their belief in the gods and their belief in magic so when they write about Omen, when she writes about omens when she writes about religious rituals when she writes about there's this wonderful moments at one point in the last of the wine where one of the characters he set off from his house before dawn and it's dark and then he, he goes right to the edge of Athens and he turns around to look and the sun is rising over the city and he sees the light strike the big statue of Athena on the top of the city on the sort of on the top of the city on the path path non and he feels this kind of moment of absolute religious rapture that the gods are all there in the air around him and you just think yeah yeah, that's that's how it was. That that's how they felt about their gods, and that's is kind of what I'm trying to convey. In the in my books, it's not kind of I don't have a worked out theology, and she doesn't. You know, it's not the gods aren't real, or I don't have an explanation for how they work, or I don't have rules. It's just people absolutely believe, and the people in her world absolutely believe. And it's just there. It's a totally alien world. And similarly, I mean, so Bogoas is a he's brought up as a Persian, so he's a he's essentially a Zoroastrian. And then he meets the Greeks, and obviously he's introduced to Greek religion, and he's trying he's sort of working out a way that he can sort of link the two. He doesn't he doesn't kind of think, oh, you know, I'm I believe this and they believe that. It's a kind of Newman that they all have this sense of the world being full of the divine and just different names people have for the same. People have different ways of talking about the fact the world is incredibly haunt, God haunted and magical and strange. And she just somehow gets it. So you really believe it. You can really see why you can see this world as totally alien to, to us coming from a sort of rational Christian living in a kind of rational Christian worldview you completely see the alienness of it but also the complete way it completely makes sense coherently what I really hate in a lot of historical novels is that kind of I'm now going to give you the one rational atheist kind of you know it's a post in I'm going to give you the one post enlightenment rational atheist in medieval England or wherever and the or that kind of in some fancy you get that really kind of conceptualized I'm going to give you a little very neat, these are the gods and this is how they operate and there's no blurring and everyone knows exactly what they each do. And it's all terrible. It's almost kind of catalogued, almost like a Dewey Decimal System. And, you know, this is this God does this and this God does that. Or that kind of thing that the Marvel multiverse is doing where everything's explained and everything has backstories and everything has some kind of incredibly if there's any kind of contradictions well that's because this is really complicated explanation for that <laughs> and she doesn't have any of that she just has this weird magical world that is utterly utterly real mm. and she's also just a damn fine writer she's just just her descriptions of this description she has of the snow up in the mountains of Ekbatana, which is the summer capital of the Persian Empire. So they go there and Persian kings are supposed to go in the summer because it's cool and you're up in this beautiful palace up on the top of a mountain. And the first time we go there, we're, we're with Darius and it's winter and they're not supposed to be there. And there's snow on the mountaintops. And then we go there again in summer with Alexander and it is summer and it's this cool, beautiful palace, shady palace to get out the hot wind. And the way she describes that is just, it's the best kind of travel writing to make you see the world, see things in the world that you're never going to see. The world is just give you things that are just beautiful beyond anything you're going to experience. She's just, yeah, no, her books are amazing. <laughs> they're just, I, I just adore them. I read them every couple of years because they're just so, so good. Wow. So that's Mary Rennie. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, uh, so we'd have another question. Um, and I, I, I apologize. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. I think it's Tabir X Derberry. I'm not sure if it's a real name or not. So I, I apologize if I butchered your name. I'll have to get the, the correct pronunciation. But uh, their question was, uh, what is the time frame, give or take, for you to come up with structure, however loose, 
for one of your novels? Oh, see, I don't structure them at all. Um, I mean, obviously, I've not written that many novels. It's not like a sort of, I've written three published novels. I've not, I've written quite a few short stories and I'm right. I'm writing book two of something at the moment. It's not like I've kind of written, this isn't speaking from the kind of, oh yes, my 15 novels, but um, I don't structure anything. I have no idea <laughs> what I'm doing. I <laughs> So yeah, as I sort of said earlier, Court of Broken Knives, I had no idea. I had no idea I was writing a novel, let alone I was writing a grimdark epic fantasy novel. That book just kind of came out in this kind of mad, blood where I had no idea what was happening from page to page obviously then the second two novels in the trilogy had to have more structure because we'd sold it as a trilogy <laughs> that had to have some kind of we'd sold that you have to you sell with synopsis for books two and three and obviously the the public if you then turn around to the, sort of the publisher and say well actually I'm going to tell you know I actually have changed my mind about what happens completely I'd want something totally different to happen. They may be like, yeah, but we didn't want that to happen. We bought this on the understanding, understanding it happens, ends like that. And commercially, it cannot end like that. So, no. And also, of course, by then I'd had my world set up and my character set up. So, unless you'd had that. And then they woke up and it was all a dream thing. It wouldn't work if you didn't have some kind of structure in your head. <laughs> so, by the time I'd finished Scott Broken Knives, I knew where the whole thing was going. I could see where the whole story was. I understood exactly what it was I was writing. I had the I had the end, the that kind of last the last little scene certainly the last scene with Thalia and in uh, the, the House of Sacrifice I had that that was in my head how it ended from very early on and the whole thing was there but it is I then had to get there and the third book was actually a real nightmare because it's like well I know what the ending is so what's the point of writing the book why don't I just write and then some stuff happened and then here's the final paragraph because. <laughs> It was really hard not writing the whole book with this kind of everything is just going to foreshadow that final closing paragraph because surely that's the point of this book now, it's finishing it. And that was kind of weird. But I don't structure at all, but I have it all in my head, if that makes any sense. I don't plan any of it. I don't have any notes. I keep notes as I'm going along so I remember who someone's dad's called or what someone's favourite colour is. But I don't have any, I don't do any world building. I don't have any structures or any plans, any outline. I just write and I think about it all the time when I'm writing. And it's just there. And yeah, I do have to go back all the time and rewrite stuff, just re even really tiny details like what someone's favourite colour is because I suddenly realise, oh, it's quite important later on. But there are almost moments where I'm writing something and then I'll be like, oh, that tiny detail where I talked about someone's favourite colour in chapter two, it didn't seem like anything. But now I suddenly realise why it's important. It's important because this scene I've written, it becomes symbolically important that. And that sort of, I sometimes say to people, and this sounds so pretentious, <laughs> that the books exist. They have some kind of platonic existence up there somewhere. And they just kind of come and they sort of come into my head and I type them out and I I have no control over them. They existed already. Mm. I'm just kind of, I'm just the conduit or something which sounds so pretentious. <laughs> but that does how it feels, kind of. That's a, I, When I, my PhD was actually on Victorian occultism and the beginnings of modernism and lots of people were like, poet Yeats was really, really interested in automatic writing. Lots of people at that time were interested in automatic writing and the idea that or kind of write it, the idea that you're on mediumship and things like that. And I can actually really see why, because it does feel that kind of sense of, I just sit down and I just kind of almost watching my fingers type. I can see these words appearing on the screen. It's like, whoa. And it does kind of feel like it's just sort of, <laughs> it just feels like I might carry on without me actually being kind of quite aware of it. <laughs> and uh, Michael Hall had a question. Um, he said, uh, the question was, what's next? Also, have you read The Black Leopard, Red Wolf by uh, Marlon James? I feel it'd be right up your wheelhouse, along with Baker and Harrison. I haven't actually read. I really should read reads. I can't remember which way around the book is. Red, Black Leopard, Red Tie? No, which way uh, around Black, is it? Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Yeah, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. I should read it. I actually I gave it to my dad for Christmas. Hmm. 
no I didn't I bought it for my mum to give to my dad for Christmas <laughs> but um and I should borrow it I really should read it I really really should read it it's actually become slightly a bit of a thing where it's like I know I'm going to hate the bastard for doing what I do better so I'm not going to read it <laughs> you know reading it like oh damn oh damn I just <laughs> what's the point because <laughs> I know I mean he's I know I really should read it it's um but it kind of feels like I don't know it feels like if I'd read it 10 years ago it'd have been like oh my god I can't stop talking about this book but now it's just gonna be like oh you bastard <laughs> what's the point of me writing anymore but um no I must read it I must borrow it from my dad having bought it for him um <laughs> also I have to admit actually the last couple of years I've been mostly I have been mostly rereading stuff from my teens like a lot of us have I think because it kind of feels like I'm going to go back and pretend I'm 16. And yeah, the world was pretty shit when I was 16 as well, but I was 16. I could kind of pretend it was going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> so I should try and get back into that kind of optimism of youth vibes. And so that means I should read a lot of the stuff I was reading at that age, just to kind of pretend. And mm. it kind of felt like, okay, I know where, I know where this book is going to go. I know what the ending is. There are going to be no even more appalling surprises where just when I think everything's all right, something gets even worse. So that, that kind of feels, that felt quite good the last couple of years as well. Um, mm. But yeah, so that that's why, well, that's one of the many reasons why I haven't read it. And, but I know I really should and I feel really guilty that I haven't read it. And I know I love it. But um, what was the other bit? What am I doing next? Okay, so I haven't, yeah, as I said, I haven't been doing very much recently. I should have been doing a hell of a lot. I taught two yeah. different primary school maths classes at the same time at one point. I mean, <laughs> <you know. laughs> while also supposedly doing my day job. I mean, like, come on, come on. That, that, I kind of feel like I peaked for life at that point. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, no, I haven't been doing much writing recently. I've got the thing I was writing with Michael R. Fletcher, which is written I'm, at some point. Poor Sarah Chorn is going to send some edit back, edits back, it's just saying, what the fuck, guys? Why did you not bother reading anything? You do know that there is no internal coherence list or thing at all. Can you just at least sort it out so it's not comp? They haven't, it hasn't been day for 46 hours straight now, guys, because, you know, kind of. <laughs> and the same person doesn't die eight times. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's written. I've got a story being published in a wonderful grim dark anthology called the the king must fall and apparently me and michael R. fletcher were the first two people that adrian wrote asked to write for for that to write that but those stories for that book which is just wonderful <laughs> um and that that's the last empires of dust story that's me absolutely just kind of laying that and that's felt really weird as well as i said marath and thalia have been with me my whole life i now realize I used to write a lot, tell myself and write a lot of stories that were kind of based on the Mabinogion. But the main characters that were always Marath and Thalia, and now their story's done completely. And my head actually kind of... A bit of me died with the ending of their story. A bit of me ended. Hmm. And it felt really... It's been really hard. It's not like I could just be like, oh, I will now... I have this idea. It feels like I drain something out of myself and I need to let my everything in me resettle a bit and mess and sort of, you know, find I need to find another bit of my soul that I'm gonna to put to paper. And I think I'm there now. Hmm. And I am writing something, it's slightly more it's got more of a kind of Mabinogi on, maybe like um it's quite influenced by stuff like the like the stories around Cucullan, Irish mythology, which is raw and weird and grim and in some ways utterly amoral. Again, this is a kind of god god haunted world. It's a pre-Christian world, it's a god haunted world, but not necessarily a moral world. It's a world where it's a very raw, bleak world where the gods are kind of there. And they're not necessarily good gods. That whole notion of kind of a salvationist, good interventionist god is completely absent because it's a pre-Christian pagan world. And I'm, but I'm trying to write something within that kind of setting, which is also fundamentally more about good and evil. So I'm trying to write something about that there are there are line, moral lines that one should not cross, and there are moral lines that, in fact 
one should die and kill to protect. Mm. And that actually maybe the kind of very cynical, yeah, but you can always find your, find another set of principles down the next street or kind of, yeah, but think, you know, when, when you are fighting against evil, you still need to remember that the evil you are fighting, these are also, these two are men. These two love and have loved. And what you do is still a terrible thing to kill something, you know, to kill is always a crime. That there are lines that are crossed, at which point one can only say, you must fight. And if you kill and if you die, that is necessary. Mm -hmm. And in the end, even though I know that you who I'm killing are just another young person dragged into this and people will be destroyed by your death and you <laughs> it is still right and necessary that i kill you because some things just cannot stand mm -hmm. and it's i'm trying i'm kind of <laughs> that's a, that more absolutist viewpoint is i think something i'm coming around to knowing the pity of war but also knowing that it must be done i did sort of find myself I was watching the Lord of the Rings films over Christmas with my children, which was absolutely wonderful. We watched them twice over Christmas. It's mm. just wonderful getting seeing them with my children for the first time and talking about, you know, Theodin with the, you know, the amazing The Last Ride of the Rohirrim, which is done so beautifully in The Return of the King. And they can see the battle taking place outside Minas Tirith. And it's so clear. I haven't actually read the books for a long time to remember, but in the you know in the film it's so made so clear. Theodin knows he will die. He knows that almost all the Rohirrim will die. He knows that this is probably the end of his people. Whatever happens, the best that he can hope for is that his people die or his people are destroyed, but Minas Tirith is saved. And he knows that there's no choice. That he has to do this. That his death leading all his people to their death is necessary because the alternative is worse mm -hmm. and i'm kind of trying to explore that a bit more in my writing it sounds actually it sounds incredibly bleak and grim i'm trying to <laughs> i'm trying to hang on to that as hope it's that kind of hopeful you know that sort of <sighs> some things are worth you know some things are worth that and some things it has sometimes it has to be and the kind of I don't want to say the joy of that, but yeah, the kind of, you know, the nobility of that, the kind of not cheap and not in a kind of cheap way, but in a, not in a cheap kind of, you know, it is honourable to do this, but it is, it is necessary. We've seen, again, we've seen in the, one of the, some of the things we've seen in the last couple of years that to sacrifice the self, to make sacrifices for the, the, the community and for what others' health and for the health of people we're never going to, we are never going to meet and never will actually, you know, is, and incredibly important the fact that so many of us have done it mm. is really important and i'm trying to talk about that in a more positive way god this does not make these new books sound remotely <laughs> cheery but they really are they're also very much more about family because of obviously like many of us i've spent the last year a couple of years locked in with my family basically so that family has become certainly it's been really noticeable amongst everyone i know that family is so much more important now everyone really what, what do you value? Well, actually, what I value is having time with my children mm -hmm. and writing that more. That kind of things. Being a fabulous author was is wonderful, <laughs> but actually, you know, being with my kids is yeah. so sort of something to discover just how important that is. Yeah. 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 That's what really matters. Yeah. So I do just have a couple more questions for you. The time has just flown by. Sorry, I can I... talk on for hours. I know. Right. I just someone mentioned someone like well, Mary Reno, and like half an hour later, I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's wonderful because I, I I want to ask questions to get you to talk. So it's 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 great that I love all the answers. So it's it's really wonderful for me because if it was all yes or no answers, then <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's really it's really wonderful. But uh, I do. I have a, just a couple more questions for you that I like to ask every guest. Um, so I was curious if 
If there's ever been a hobby or a thing that you were excited to try, but when you tried it, you did not enjoy it. Oh God. Um, pretty much everything I've ever tried apart from writing. It's just, <laughs> um, yeah, actually, no, I'm, I'm like, I love dancing. No, that's not really a hobby. I used to, um, in my younger days, I used to go out to, uh, I used to be really on the goth scene. I used to have, God, I used to wear these massive hair pieces. That's where the whole <laughs> shoes thing come from. I used to wear these massive fetish, I used to be on the goth fetish scene. That's where the fetish model thing comes from as well. I used to be a fetish model, I used to be on the goth fetish scene. I used to wear these ridiculous like corsets and huge black silk dresses. And I go and dance in goth nights and I love dancing, but um, I can't dance in the sense of, you know, I couldn't, I can't cha 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 or waltz or anything. I can kind of do weird gothy stuff, but yeah, I can't dance properly. I like doing aerobics and running when I'm crap at them, but I can't, <laughs> I can bake cakes if you can cope with they're slightly burnt on top and they're a bit soggy in the bottom. And they're very, very nice cakes. They're just, they're never, you know, they're never going to win a prize for best looking cake, but they do taste nice. Um, I can't cook anything apart from cakes. I can't draw. I can't paint. I can't sing. I can't play music. I can't drive. Um, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't play any sports. I'm, I, I do aerobics, but I can't do aerobics in the class because I'm always that person at the back going left and everyone else is going right and yeah. doing like hitting people in the face because I'm going the wrong way. Uh, yeah, I'm useless. I realise. My son was talking about tennis and I was forced to confess that in my life, my whole time at school, whenever they tried to get us to do tennis, I went to an all girls school, they were quite into tennis. I have never hit, managed to make a ball and a racket in any, have contact in any sport. Hmm. I have never made a ball or a badminton racket or anything ever have contact with a racket. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, yeah, I can't, I can't do anything. I read and write. That's the only thing. Read, write, occasionally watch TV, and yeah, do stuff with my children. That's that's all. That's all I can. That's all. Go to the, go to museums and the theatre and stuff. But yeah, I can't do anything but write. Basically, read and write. But, which yeah, kind of just matters to me, really, because I mean, I know I'm good at writing. I know I don't want to sound arrogant, but I know I can write well. So the rest of it doesn't matter. Kind of. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. kind of. Yeah. Although that's what I tell myself anyway when I'm presenting people with another with birth and my children with another birthday cake where it's like, well, look, if you just cut the top off where it's a bit black and just, you know, like kind of ignore the fact it's a bit undercooked. It's really nice though. <laughs> yeah. If it tastes good, it doesn't matter what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Um and I was uh next question is, um, what would your readers be surprised to learn about you? Oh, good grief. Um, see, I'm so... I give such long answers to anything. I'm surprised there's anything people don't know about me. Um, <laughs> I don't know, really. Um, what would my surprise is? Uh, I guess if you didn't know me, that I'm a... I guess if you'd only, never read an interview with me and had only read my books, that I'm a really loving mum and love my kids and um, I'm a really nice person. Um <laughs> Actually, there's this. I've done so. I've done interviews with me. Oh yeah, yeah. No, me. So me and see, someone was saying that they'd always they're really keen about this thing with me and, me and my wife actually doing collaboration. Someone was saying, oh, you know, one when the world when we're all able to travel again, you know, their big dream is that me and my wife actually will be at a convention together, hmm. and that they would get to meet the pair of us. And I was like, no, you don't want that because you'd be so disappointed because we're so. <laughs> I don't know what you think of the two of us, but we're just really nice people. And you'd be really disappointed if you met the two of us. Because <laughs> all your illusions would be just shatters. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so I just have two more for you. Uh, the next one is, uh, what was your first job? What was my first job? Oh, God. So, um depends whether you count if you count the sort of Saturday jobs you do when you're quite young I very briefly worked in a sandwich and cake shop in mm. the town I grew up in and which I now live I'm back living in which was the most appalling job and anyone who bought sandwiches from that sandwich shop when I was the one making the sandwiches I am so sorry <laughs> <laughs> I was so bad so I couldn't even the whole like you know you're, I'd be presented with sort of 
this vast pile of ready sliced loaves and this massive tub of really cheap butter and told to butter all these loaves. And of course the butter's just come out of the fridge overnight and it's like these I'm so I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Anyone who bought sandwiches from Dorrington's Bishop Stortford. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but the, apart from stuff like that, brief jobs like that, actually the only job I've ever had is the office job. Um I'm a, I'm a civil servant in the UK government and that's actually the only job I've ever had because, um, yeah, I've done that. I started doing that when I left university. Oh, and the, yeah, the teaching when I was at university. I did some teaching when I was at university, which was, again, I'm so sorry if you're in my if you're in my BA, um, Modernists English lit if you were in my BA, I can't remember what the course was, something like Foundations of English Literature course. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> it was a disaster, I know. Um, but yeah, no, apart from stuff like that, I've been I've been a civil servant since I started working. Mm. I will probably retire from that job at about 65, 70. It's got a good pension scheme. It's got really good death and service benefits. Um, it's an enjoyable job. Mm. It, yeah, most I hope several other, some of the other people do it also have strange esoteric interests, which it allows them to pursue also. Actually, Anthony Ryan was also a UK civil servant. We have had a really bizarre conversation on Twitter about our less, the lesser known parts of our canon, where I wrote the social justice strategy for the then coalition government. And he wrote some minor, I can't remember what they were. I think they might've been minor bits of tax law. So we were exchanging like kind of, yeah, the real completist needs to go and track down Anthony Ryan's consultation on some areas of UK tax law. Wow. <laughs> and, and the consultation document I wrote about guaranteed minimum pensions. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> there are quite a few civil servant writers. It's um, I'm pretty certain the guy who wrote Watership Down was a civil servant as well. Hmm. Quite a few UK civil servants are novelists. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the, the last question I have for you is, uh, you know, I always try to come up with, with good questions and intriguing questions for my guests. So if the roles were reversed and you were in my position, was there a question that uh, you would have asked that I did not ask? Oh, I have no idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh God! See, that's that's why. See, I'm, I'm no. I, all I can do is write. I can't interview okay. people. <laughs> Neither can I. So it's okay. Oh, <laughs> so, um, Anna Stevens and I had this cunning plan at one point when our books were first first published around the same time that we'd interview each other and we could mm. do it. It's this whole kind of slightly gimmicky Anna on Anna thing, and it'd all be a bit. And it completely broke down because both of us were like, "I've never interviewed anyone. I've got no idea to what." And yeah, it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I think I think we'll add interviewing people to my vast list of things I cannot do. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you if you think of any, if you think of it, just let me know. But it's it's always good to get new questions. Or, you know. Actually, I should guess I don't know. There's you know, there are things you always want people to ask you. Things like how do you so how do you pronounce your character's name then, and that kind of canonical. If um, it's Thalia, it's not Talia, it's Thalia, and because oh, I had okay. no idea that that. The name Thalia, name Talia, is spelt the same way as my name Thal. The, my character's name Thalia, and when someone first just casually said, "Oh, Talia," I was like, "What? Wait, no!" It's like <laughs> I thought Talia was spelt T. Hey, I thought it was nature. <laughs> it's a kind of yeah, that's a thing. I think um, uh, yeah, Mark Lawrence gets a bit upset about this as well it's about oh. the whole George, the whole George Jorg Jorg thing. Like, and although I'm not even sure he knows how it's pronounced anymore, <laughs> but other than that, no, I can't. Okay, <laughs> no, I can't think of any questions. Well, if you think of anything, let me know <laughs> if, uh, if something comes to you. But if someone wants to connect with you, uh, where's the best place to find you or uh, just say hello to you? Okay, so I'm on Facebook as Anna Smith Spark, I've also got a Facebook author page, Anna Smith Spark. I have no idea why the point of, I know what people regularly ask, what is the point of a Facebook author page? I have no idea, but I feel I ought to have one. I'm on Instagram as Anna Smith Spark. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Cream of Queen of Grimdark, which was not me. That was Mike Fletcher. He reviewed me early on and called me the Queen of Grimdark. 
that was not people always say it's like comes from a really arrogant self dub things but it wasn't it was mike and also i did the twitter handle the wrong way around so i'm now stuck with that forever because my official twitter name is queen of grimdog <laughs> so um yeah i'm just i'm stuck with it. i'd have to delete the account and start again if i ever st- if i start writing chick lit i'm so screwed because <laughs> I have to have some massive explanation every time I'm on romance platforms about why my Twitter handle was that. But yeah, um, and I'm not actually on those things very often anymore because I, I kind of discovered during lockdown that actually my mental health is so much better when I'm not on social media that much. Yeah. I'm on this new thing. There's a Discord group called the SFF Oasis, which I'm supposedly a member of, and I. I'm a bit scared and I went on it once and said hi I'm here and this is cool and then I've been too scared to go on it again because I don't understand what Discord is but I should go on that again and I will go on that again I promise um I've just been a bit busy recently and yeah I'm just Anna Smith Spark on that I'm um, in the only Anna Smith Spark in the world so if I appear in something as Anna Smith Spark on Reddit or something that is me because there is no Anna Anna Smith Spark in the world <laughs> as far as I'm aware <laughs> it's a very unusual surname Somewhere, some somewhere, someone named Anna Smith Spark is saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm." No, I'm no, we're yeah. pretty certain from the surname there are no other Smith Sparks, in fact. That's, so, <laughs> kind of... that's awesome. Yes, well, that's, and I've got a website, www.quarterbrokenknives.com as well. Which yeah, that's got my video and all this fantastic yeah. stuff. Wonderful video yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely it's great. Amazing video. Yeah. So thank you again. It, the time just flew by. I didn't even get to a quarter of my questions I had for you. <laughs> no, but it was, it was really great. I, I had a wonderful time and a really inspiring and just really learned a lot. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, really thank you. It. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, I'm kind of getting back into doing interviews and talking to people and doing author stuff and being an author again. And it is, <laughs> it's really nice. It's really, really nice. So. <laughs> thank you so much for having me yeah thank you so much we'll see see you soon bye